Welcome to the first Aspen Ideas live pitch event. Here we have just the five finalists of more than 100 people, and they're going to pitch their world-changing ideas to our panel of judges. And the winner will be determined by the judges and also by your votes. So at the end, we're going to have you text in votes. I'll explain how to do that at the end. Is going to get $25,000 to go out in the world, execute their idea, and then come back next year and on this stage, tell us what they did, tell us how it went. And if at that point we judge that it was insufficient, they pay back the $25,000 <laughs> plus 10,000% interest. So it's very high stakes. That's not true, but they will return next year. And uh, so all the Aspen scholars and presenters were invited to participate. And here you have, uh, you, you have the five finalists as determined by votes on the website. Um, so here's how it works. They're each going to come up in order. I'm just going to say the name, uh, the name of their, their name, the uh, name of the idea that they're pitching. And they just have four minutes, and that's really strict. We were going to have a buzzer at the end of the four minutes, but then they said there's no buzzer. I have to be the buzzer, so uh, I'll just physically make them stop talking somehow. And then there's six minutes of questions from the judges uh, to the, to the uh, presenter. And uh, then they'll leave, then we'll go through that uh, five times for each of the five ideas. Then the judges will adjourn, we'll vote, the judges will consider the vote in their uh, ruling. And uh, during that time, the contestants will come back on stage, we'll have a little bit of audience QA, so if you have questions, keep them in mind. Uh, we can address them at that time. And uh, then the judges will come back, and at the very end, you will learn who, who wins. So let me uh, start by introducing our judges. Uh, we have Neil Baer, who's uh, stand up in turn, and you can give them a, a round of applause. He's a physician, uh, a TV writer and producer whose credits include Under the Dome and ER. Uh, we have Dave Chokchi, who is an assistant VP. <laughs> assistant VP at uh, New York City Health Hospitals Corporation. Uh, Tom DeRosa. He's uh, CEO of HCN, uh, which is the largest owner of healthcare properties in the US, UK, and Canada. Uh, Tara Montgomery, a senior director and, uh, of Health Impact at Consumer Reports and a consumer health advocate. And uh, finally, Marika Chiori Clark, who is a, a principal at Social Studio. That's social spelled S-O-S-H-L. And they create social impact through design. Okay, so uh, let's get this started. We will start off with uh, the first of our five ideas pitches, which is uh, Rubiat Khan and his ideas. <laughs> Doctor in a tab, your four minutes begins now. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, can you turn on the mic? It's on. It's on. This is rural Bangladesh, and that person in the middle is you. You're one of two billion people in the world who lack access to doctors. This morning, you woke up with terrible abdominal pain. Now, you don't know if this is something benign like gastric or something urgent like appendicitis. The nearest hospital is 50 miles away. It would take you a half a day, or if not more, to get there. You don't know if the doctor will be there, if you're a woman, God help you, because you cannot go alone, and your husband doesn't have time to take you. And you've heard stories of your neighbors and friends who have been exploited by the system and have not reached a cure despite spending tons of money. So would you trust this healthcare system? Instead, you trust this guy, the same, the, your trusted old doctor uncle, the person from the nearby pharmacy who doesn't have any medical training, but has seen you and your family all your life. You've gone to him as a child. He even checks up on your grandmother on your way home, on, on his way home. Now, this person doesn't have any medical training, and he might actually uh, cause more harm than good by giving you more antibiotics and steroids than you need. But all of that doesn't matter because he's your friend. Now, people like this guy has forever been treated by the medical community as a part of the problem. At MDOC, which I'm the CEO of, we treat them as part of the solution. So 
we equip these pharmacists in the rural villages with the technology and training necessary to connect rural patients with doctors in the city. And how does it work? Remember your abdominal pain? You walk to the nearby pharmacy. This pharmacist takes out his tablet, asks you a few questions guided by an algorithm about your medical history, your current complications, about your vitals, sends all of this information to the cloud. The doctor who's sitting almost hundreds of miles away can look at this information and write out a, pres a prescription after having a consultation if necessary. So they can call, they can ask a few additional questions, get some physical examinations done, and then in five minutes, you walk away with a prescription and medicines in your bag. In the last one year, we have tested this with over, around 2,000 patients in rural Bangladesh, and what we see is extremely high levels of patient satisfaction, about a 90% net promoter score, and we see that about 25% of our patients actually come back for the service despite it being a paid service. So what is the next step? We want to actually take this to a larger scale and test health impact over the next one year, reaching 50,000 patients. And we also test it out, want to test it out in a small scale in Myanmar to see if it's, it is replicable. We have funding for all of that, but before that, what is critical is that we take all the learnings we have from the last one year of our field trials and improve the technology further. For example, we want to streamline the patient, streamline the experience of the pharmacist so that they can do it much more quickly and learn to do it much more quickly so that we can scale it further. We want to expand the algorithms to, the, to be able to uh, cover more conditions and reach more patients. The $25,000 will help us do just that. But that is not all. Our real vision is to create a profitable model for taking quality healthcare to rural areas. That will not only involve uh, staying on top of the latest technologies like artificial intelligence, medical sensors, but it will also involve innovating on the business models. How can we tap into the other sources of revenue, advertising, data, um, referrals, in order to actually create a revolution? And we want to do that because that would take healthcare to the rural areas of the world. Thank you. The questions from the judges. Rubia, would you talk us through how you plan to train the pharmacists? So the pharmacists have been uh, treating patients for a long time, so they know some things from experience. Um, we do some medical trainings with our doctors um, about a couple of days so that they know the basic examinations, they can administer the basic blood pressure machine and, and things like that, which they already know somewhat, um, but we want to make sure that they do it well. And we also train them on the, using the tablet. But the tablet, uh, the goal is to streamline the experience on the tablet so, and make it so easy that it, it is easy to pick up on their own so that we don't need to train them every time. Um, so that, that's what it entails right now. So I, I would say important problem, um, very interesting approach com combining community health workers with telemedicine. Uh, my question is a simple clinical one. What happens when the patient with abdominal pain does have appendicitis? So, of course, and uh, that will be figured out through that consultation, and then um, if the doctor cannot address it, of course, there will be many conditions that they cannot address um, remotely. In those cases, they can actually make the referral to the nearby hospital. So, in those cases, we can give them information on which hospital they can go to, how much it will cost, when the doctor sits there. So, all of that information is really valuable so that they don't have to make that trip unnecessarily. Um, and also, we can probably address 50, 60, 70 percent of the complications on site, and then the rest, 30 percent, we, we can refer. To uh, Dave's, just, Dave's question, how does the pharmacist differentiate between uh, an appendicitis, bowel obstruction, or constipation? How would that work? So um, they would have to be guided by the doctor, of course, um, and the doctor would tell them to do, like, uh, put pressure on certain points and see if, um, like, the like how the patient responds and things like that, and also ask targeted questions to see. And of course, there will be some cases where it's not possible to diagnose uh, directly, and, uh, but that, in our opinion, that's a small minority of the conditions that will happen. And in case of real emergencies, people usually don't come to the pharmacist anyway. They run to the nearby hospital, even if it takes half a day. So um, we're, we're not really talking about the really like emergency urgent conditions, but the pro problems that people actually um, wait until they become really severe uh, to solve and don't seek treatment.
but then give them a very easy access point so that where they can actually seek treatment uh, right away rather than waiting for it. Hi. Um, you Hi. described a very fragile infrastructure in Bangladesh, which is part of the motivation to do this. But what about the internet and web connectivity infrastructure to enable people to send data to the cloud, transmit things as you described? That, that's the amazing part, right? Because um, in Bangladesh, 99% of people have access to a phone. Um, about 99% of the population lives in areas where there is mobile connectivity. And 3G covers about 60% of the population. So in the next two years, 3G is going to go nationwide. Okay. So, um, And I've seen that a lot of programs like this end up breaking down when there's not a system in place to maintain the actual tablets. Mm -hmm. So you know they might break and they don't know how to fix it and then they stop using the program. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to how that maintenance system would work and also sure. um, what mechanism is there to work with pharmacists who are not literate so they can't use the tablet system you're talking about? Right, so um, to address the first question, we have troubleshooting personnel and like basically monitoring staff who uh, manage about 10 pharmacists each and uh, they would also do help with some troubleshooting. In cases where, and we also use tablets that are locally manufactured like uh, from Bangladeshi companies which have um, it, like in the nearby towns, they have a service point and things like that, so people can actually access those service points if necessary. Um, in mo most areas of Bangladesh, pharmacists are usually the more literate people in the community, and we have, until now, we have not met a pharmacist who doesn't, is not literate. And in fact, I'll share an interesting story. Uh, we initially started off the tablet with uh, a Bangla keyboard uh, in Bengali so that they could easily type it. In fact, when we went to the field, we found that they would actually prefer an English keyboard because they find it much easier to type on an English keyboard than a Bangla keyboard. So that, like, it just shows that uh, they're, they're actually more literate than we expect them to be. Another question. Um, on your business model side, you mentioned quickly that this was a paid service. Mm -hmm. How, can you go into that in a little more detail? Sure, sure. So um, the patients pay a service fee, uh, and out of that, a portion is kept by the pharmacist, and the remaining comes to us to manage the entire infrastructure, maintain the doctor roster, and, and all of that. Um, the goal is to increasingly tap into other sources of revenue. So as we scale the service, as more data becomes part of it, as more doctors become part of it, we can advertise for the doctors, we can uh, like promote the quality pharmaceutical companies. So in a lot of ways, we can actually tap into alternate revenue streams that brings down the cost for the end user further. So you've, you've got some evidence of willingness to pay already. Absolutely. Yeah. So the 2,000 patients have paid for the paid for the service. So you told us that uh, you have funding to take the 2,000 patients to 50,000 yeah. patients. Talk a little bit about what your funding sources are. So we have funding from USAID, the uh, Development Innovation Ventures Fund, uh, in stage one, and we also have a, a philanthropic investor in the U.S. who's uh, putting in uh, equity capital. Last think? question. Uh, do you think there's the potential for, um, for this approach to increase inappropriate antibiotic prescribing and thereby increase antibiotic resistance? It would actually decrease it um, because we have uh, all of these pharmacists who have no idea about uh, like how to properly use antibiotics and steroids, and they're always overprescribing to err on the side of um, cure as much as, uh, like, a as early as possible. So even like we've seen small kids, uh, like a two-year-old, with simple diarrhea getting uh, ciprofloxacin. Uh, so really strong antibiotics for very simple complications. Mm -hmm. So like for those kinds of things, like we can actually prevent it by having a doctor kind of double check on. Um, so a, a dual goal for our service is to actually curb the malpractice of the, of the pharmacist. And that's Dr. Inatab. Thank you so much. For Thank you. Time. All right, so next with the idea is touching where it hurts, reducing error, and bringing skill to the bedside, we have Abraham Verghese. A few years ago, a woman showed up to our emergency room in circulatory collapse, and she stopped breathing. She was intensely resuscitated and then taken to the x-ray suite because they suspected that she had a pulmonary embolism. Instead, they found under CAT scan that she had bilateral breast tumors that had metastasized fairly widely. What was really tragic though was that in the preceding two to three years, she'd been seen four times in different healthcare institutions, four opportunities on a simple physical exam to detect these tumors at a much earlier stage, instead of which 
uh, the, the opportunity was missed. A few years ago, the Institute of Medicine published this wonderful report, To Err is Human, with the alarming metaphor that the equivalent of a jumbo jet crashing every day is the number of errors that we make in medicine every day. And we've made a huge impact on those kinds of errors, medication errors, wrong site surgery, so on. But the kind of error I'm describing isn't captured by that. It's a kind of error only known by and large to other physicians. The cause for this is the large scale inattentiveness that is a part of our system. Uh, papers are showing that the average 12 hour shift in an emergency room, the emergency medicine physician is spending eight of those hours looking at the computer. This has been reproduced in residents, studies of residents, studies of interns. Uh, the computer has really gotten in the way. Now we know that if you're texting when you're driving, if you're not paying attention to your task, there can be tragic consequences. Well, if you're inattentive to the patient in front of you, if you're not doing the simplest things that you're supposed to do, there are consequences. At one level, the consequences are, right, as I described earlier, you're missing obvious diagnoses. This is a, a gentleman who came in with chest pain, or a, a gentleman like this came in with chest pain, was whisked away to the ICU on his way to the uh, car cardiac catheterization suite before someone spotted the rash of shingles, uh, which could have spared him all of that. That kind of error, uh, we have collected now 200 anecdotes of that kind of error, which only other physicians know about, and I think it's quite common. It might well be the equivalent of a busload of people crashing every day. Perhaps not the jumbo jet, but a busload. The other consequence of this kind of inattentiveness is that we're not with the patient in the manner patients want. It's telling how often patients use the terms, he or she didn't touch me. He or she did not lay a hand on me. Clearly, the ritual is important to the patient. It's also exceedingly important to the physician. We have this alarming statistic that 50% of primary care physicians are burnt out, which tells you it's not a systemic, it's not a personal issue, it's a systemic issue, and I think is, it's because they're missing out on the rich uh, tradition and ritual of examining the patient and having to deal with this third party in the room which is consuming all their attention. So what solutions I'm proposing are first teaching bedside skills in more than a token way, teaching physicians advanced bedside skills. I stand before you as a board certified internal medicine specialist, and yet no one has ever seen me, tested me at the bedside examining a patient. I did that on the basis of a multiple choice test. So we at Stanford have started something, a grassroots movement we call the Stanford Medicine 25, trying to emphasize clinical skills. It seems to have struck a chord because this little grassroots effort has 5,000 visits from doctors, residents, and others uh, every single day. I'm hoping with your help and support, we can scale this up to 50,000 visits to spread this culture of bedside medicine. Secondly, we hope to start a back to the bedside movement, a core, if you will, a medical core that champions this sort of exam. And uh, we have a meeting in September where 100 physicians are coming to talk just about this, to work on our skills. And I'm hoping that I might report back to you that we were able to scale up to maybe having 100,000 physicians be part of this back to the bedside movement. I wish and we finally, had the buzzer. I have to call a hard stop at four minutes, but hopefully some of the uh, judges can ask some elucidating questions. Thank you. I was actually done, so perfect. So, there you go. Can you talk more specifically about how you would use the $25,000? Certainly. So right now, the, the web effort that we have, which is actually much more popular than we imagined, is happening sort of after hours with all of us pitching in. Uh, we would love to hire real web help to sort of expand that. Uh, so that would be a portion of the money. The second is this symposium that we're talking about, that we're bringing together 100 people, will probably pay for itself. But we'd like to have that be the genesis of a true core. And that will have some administrative sort of structure, uh, a regular sort of newsletter, officers, and I think that part of our startup funding will go to sort of helping build that and scale it up. And finally, as I mentioned before, we've collected 200 anecdotes of a kind of medical error that only other physicians know about. We'd like to increase that collection, have many, many, many more, uh, so that we can really learn some lessons from the types of anecdotes. We've already learned some. Uh, for example, that 
very often people don't examine the back of the patient. It's as though the patient only has a front side, not a back side. Uh, very often in a patient with fever, the key might lie in a rash, but the patient's not fully exposed. Uh, simple things like that that we hope will come out of this. Two questions. Thank you very much. I'm real, as a physician, I'm really interested in this approach. Um, apart from errors, why is this important to go back to the bedside? What, what else can, can the patients get out of this? What, what else is driving this? Because um, it's hard to, as you said, uh, collect data uh, on these errors because they're anecdotal. So, so how, how, how has that moved you? How is this going? So the second part of the question is, so then how is this movement going to proceed? How are you going to involve medical schools? How are you going to change this culture? But, but primarily, why is it important beyond the errors? Well, I think shedding light on the problem is a, is a huge part of the issue. I mean, the Institute of Medicine captured so much attention, brought about major social change simply by capturing the fact that a jumbo jet uh, worth a load of people were dying every day from hospital error. I'm hoping that the publication of our 200 anecdotes in December will be the beginning of that sort of a, a public response. It's clearly something that I think the public would be uh, greatly concerned about. But more than that, talking to my parents, perhaps to yours, the refrain we always hear is, no one gave me the time, no one touched me. I'm not sure how they're recommending all these tests because they were barely with me. There's a sort of inattentiveness that I think, since the buzzword now in healthcare reform seems to be patient satisfaction, this is clearly uh, pointing in that direction. Uh, Abraham, as always, you inspire me to become a better doctor. Uh, my question to you is, do you think the back to the bedside movement is at odds with the data-driven revolution in healthcare? No, not at all. I think actually the back to the bedside movement at its best should work very well with the data-driven movement. And in fact, we need more data on all these things. And so a lot of the, the funding I'm seeking is to actually get more, more data. So not at all. I think they're, they're quite synergistic. I think that uh, most physicians would agree that you know, if we're spending all our time not with the patient and looking at screens, and if patients are unhappy, and if we have bad outcomes, then something needs to be fixed. And so I think this is, in, in its own way, data-driven. Abraham, are you aware of other similar efforts that are going on in other hospitals and uh, medical schools? And have you uh, started any uh, effort to reach out and connect with similar efforts around the US? Yeah, we began this as very much an in-house effort, something that was my passion. And uh, in putting up that website, which was mostly for in-house, we suddenly realized that we were tapping into a global audience who were reaching to us. And we have had other medical schools use this a lot. And that's the genesis of this symposium coming in September. So we have 100 physicians from medical schools in this country, as well as many from abroad who are coming to attend. So I think we've tapped into uh, a social concern of physicians that has suddenly come to the uh, come to the come to the for come forward, and we just happen to be at the front of it and trying to curate all of that. Thanks. At Consumer Reports, these issues are very close to our heart, so thank you. But but we're U.S. focused, and I'm just interested: is this a global issue? How might this be a value beyond the U.S.? Well, I think it's very much a global issue. I trained actually in Africa and in India, and I'm struck when I go back to both places how the corporate hospital has become very much like the corporate hospital here. The same sort of inattentiveness, the same, you know, the same willingness to order tests rather than figure out what's going on before you order a cost-effective test. So I think in that sense, it's very, very global. It's global also in the sense that, as you heard in the previous presentation, uh, in places that are resource poor, these skills are invaluable. What a shame if we're not doing the kind of simple exams and making diagnoses that physicians 150 years ago did with some ease. So I think it's definitely global. Talk to me more about healing. Like, why is this important? Why? I'm hearing still about errors, but I want to know how is this going to improve patient care? I think it's going to, in a major way, reduce medical error. It's the kind of error no one knows about. Secondly, I think it's going to ramp up patient satisfaction. Patients clearly want us to be more skilled. This is a, a ritual we engage in. Someone comes in, they tell you stuff they wouldn't tell anybody else. They disrobe and allow touch, which in any other society is, is a form of assault. But they allow us to do, it, to do it, and they recognize when we're shortchanging them. They know when you, you know, just stick your stethoscope on the gown or do a half-assed prod of the belly, they know that they've missed out on a ritual. Uh, Osler, William Osler, famous physician many years ago said, 
Patients will judge you not by the certificates on your wall or the hospitals you trained in, but by the manner and skill with which you do the least maneuver on them. I don't think that's changed at all. So why this is important, I would say, is to save lives. It's a global problem, but it's a hidden problem. Thank you very much. We have to end it there. Abraham Verghese. Our third presentation is Build Back Better After Ebola, the Equitas Fellowship in Entrepreneurial Leadership, presented by Peter Drobak. In Rwanda, where I've lived and worked for the last 10 years, we've unlocked a model for delivering great healthcare to people who need it the most. And the people most in need right now are in Ebola-ravaged countries in West Africa. I think we can begin to transform those health systems by training great leaders through a South-South collaboration we call the Equitas Fellowship in Entrepreneurial Leadership. Let's start in Rwanda. After the 1994 genocide that claimed a million lives, rates of disease, poverty, and hunger spiked. Most health workers were killed or fled. Life expectancy dropped to just 28 years. But in the last two decades, something remarkable has happened. We've seen the most dramatic gains in population health ever documented. We've met and surpassed all of the health-related MDGs. I've witnessed this transformation firsthand, and I think we've cracked the code the code to improving the health of the world's poorest communities. Now, the secret to Rwanda's success boils down to three things. First, commit to equity and ensure that every person receives quality health care. Second, cultivate great leaders who foster innovation. And third, focus relentlessly on results. President Clinton has said, this is the model that can save Africa. I believe this so strongly that I'm working with Partners in Health to create a new university in Rwanda dedicated to spreading these innovations around the world. And I want you to help prove that we can do it by replicating the Rwanda model in a place of urgent need. Now over the last year in West Africa, Ebola has, has ravaged health systems and claimed over 10,000 lives. Many of my own colleagues have risked their lives to help extinguish the outbreak and they're making progress. But now they face an even greater challenge, how to rebuild those decimated health systems. You know, the situation in West Africa today looks a lot like Rwanda 15, 20 years ago. What if those charged with building back better in West Africa could learn from the Rwandan leaders who once walked in their shoes and succeeded? That's what we're proposing with the Equitas Fellowship. Here's how it'll work. We'll identify outstanding young healthcare leaders in Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone and bring them to Rwanda. They'll participate in an intensive two-week global health leadership course where they'll learn from the architects of Rwanda's healthcare miracle and my colleagues from Harvard Medical School. Fellows will be paired with, uh, with a Rwandan mentor who will help them identify one great idea, an idea that can have measurable impact that they can replicate in their home countries over the next year. And as they return home armed with new knowledge, we'll create a virtual learning community to continue to support them and ensure their success. We'll stretch every dollar of the IDEAS award prize to ensure that we can fund at least one fellow from each of the three Ebola-affected countries. Award, uh, prize money will go towards uh, bringing the fellows to Rwanda and ensuring they have a rich, immersive learning experience. We'll leverage your investment by donating the leadership course tuition. Fellows can stay at my house, whatever it takes. Uh, but I know that we can succeed. Uh, and when we come back here next year, and if Peggy allows me with some of these fellows, uh, we're already going to be making an impact in each of these three countries. Now, this is going to be just the beginning because the Equitas Fellowship is going to really become part of a foundation that we're building with the new University of Global Health Equity, which we're launching in Rwanda uh, later this year. Uh, when we're successful, we'll find new partners to bring in more Equitas Fellows from other countries. And so as fellows finish, they'll become part of a growing alumni network, a network of innovators in global health delivery from around the world. Our larger mission with the University of Global Health Equity is to transform global health by reimagining education and leadership training. And this fellowship is our proof of concept. Now, 20 years ago, a child had a one in four chance of dying before her fifth birthday in Rwanda. That rate has dropped 80%. We've helped a million people pull themselves out of poverty. We've made universal health care a reality. Imagine Liberia doing the same. Imagine this happening everywhere. It can be done, and it doesn't have to take 20 years this time. So with this new fellowship, please help us take that first step together. Thanks.
So thank you. Your work is just profound in Rwanda. Uh, Rwanda. And I want to know, is two weeks enough, and how is it enough? Mm -hmm. And how does this um, virtual community work? Is it available at any time? Who's going to man it? How's that going to work? Yeah, so, so we've worked uh, in something we call the Global Health Delivery Project based at Harvard for about the last 10 years to develop a set of cases and of curricula um, that really bring immersive experiences in global health delivery to life. Uh, and we've taught several versions of this course, including in Rwanda. In fact, we had a one-week leadership course in global health delivery that we've taught now to every single uh, member of the Rwandan Ministry of Health and every leader of every district hospital. And it's transformed the way that people work. Um, the feedback that we've received from that is is, is honestly more overwhelmingly positive than anything I've ever done as an educator in, in 15 years. We think this is pretty powerful, uh, and we're going to combine that. What makes it different from sending, uh, uh, sending students to go to a place like Harvard and sit in the classroom all day long is that you can pair that with real-life immersion in healthcare delivery systems. You can learn a case on malaria control and how Rwanda reduced malaria by 80% in just two years. Then you can go out with community health workers and see them doing it in action. So we think that's important. Um, as far as as the online learning network and what's going to happen afterwards, we're going to make sure that everyone's paired with mentors. We got a community of faculty based in Rwanda who will be there to support them. We'll have at least monthly webinars to bring faculty and fellows back together, report on progress, etc. The other thing is that we've got a big network of partners in health in West Africa already, and so we'll be able to leverage that kind of in-person support as well. Thanks. Peter, uh, it seems like the sustainability of a program like this is directly tied to the University of Global Health Equity. Could mm -hmm. you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. So our larger vision for the University of Global Health Equity basically is that we believe there's a disconnect between the way that doctors and nurses and other healthcare professionals are typically trained and the skill set that we need to really affect transformative change. So our goal is to create a generation of, of really transformational leaders in global health by combining clinical and public health training with management and leadership, entrepreneurship, design thinking, social analysis, these other kinds of skills. Uh, and, and we've been working on this project for a couple of years now. I'm proud to say that we're launching the university at a very small scale in September this year with a master's in global health delivery. And we have identified funding to launch the university and to support the operations of the master's program for the first three years. Of course, we'll be receiving tuition as well and, uh, and to build the first phase of our campus. How will you be measuring success with these fellows in country? So part of the project proposal that each fellow will need to develop during their initial time in Rwanda, um, that project proposal will have to have some kind of metrics or indicators for success. And so we'll work with them to, um, to develop that and to support them and measure that over time. Yeah. So you have um, three fellowships to begin to address an enormous problem. Do you think three kind of begins to make a difference? You know, I think it does. It's just a first step. Um, but what we've seen, for example, when we began training uh, the Rwandan Ministry of Health and Global Health Delivery, and people went back armed with kind of these new, this new approach and these new skills, they kind of infected people around them, and it changed the way that they worked. Again, we also have an existing presence in those countries, and I think that's going to help. Um, I think it's going to plant a seed that's going to begin to change things. Now, I can't obviously stand here and say that one fellow is going to change everything in an entire country, uh, but I think it begins uh, to create a new way of working. And I also think that the network that we're going to create and the power of that network through the University of Global Health Equity will affect change over time. Peter, I know you have worked in Rwanda for many years, and uh, PIH has already done work in uh, Ebola-ravaged countries. Can you tell us the story of one of the future healthcare leaders um, who might become an Equitas Fellow to help us understand it? Yeah, well, you know, I myself haven't worked in West Africa, so I can't give you, uh, I can't give you the, uh, the, the story of an individual person. But the, the sort of fellow that we imagine will be, uh, a, you know, a young manager in the Ministry of Health, say someone in charge of uh, malaria control or an HIV program or something like that. It could be an up-and-coming leader and one of the critical partners working in Liberia as well um, at, at, say, Last Mile Health. And, uh, uh, and, and, and we'll work with them and mentor them over time. Yeah. Question. How much of the success of the Rwandan health system do you think is replicable in West African countries and what is different there? Yeah. 
So I think that, um, that there are a lot of context-dependent factors. Um, what we've seen in Rwanda is that you have to work, to be successful, you have to work in sort of a top-down and bottom-up way. The top-down part are these context-independent things, these basic principles like those three things that I mentioned that I think work everywhere and they're important everywhere. The bottom-up part is understanding your local context, working with community to actually design things in a way that's gonna fit into that local context. Um, I believe that, uh, that so much of this is replicable and that's exactly why we're so passionate about this new university. Um, so the context is different, but you know, for the naysayers who say that Rwanda is a one-off special case um, and it could never happen anywhere else, I say look back to where it was 15, 20 years ago. The world wrote this country off. It was the lowest recipient of aid um, in, in the world. Nobody then could have predicted what happened now. And if it, you know, in my opinion, if it can happen in Rwanda, it can happen anywhere. All right, thank you very much, Peter. Thank you. We're gonna go back. Next, we have a disruptive life-saving startup in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Jocelyn Wyatt. Thank you. The DRC has been one of the top 10 recipients of international aid in the past decade. And yet 88% of its population still lives in extreme poverty. We're seeing that one in five children in the DRC don't live to see their fifth birthday, mainly due to preventable causes like diarrheal diseases, malnutrition, and lack of access to vaccines. This is the state of most current health clinics in the DRC. There's an appalling lack of drugs, of supplies, and trained healthcare professionals. IDEO.org and the American Refugee Committee partnered to ask the question, how might we design a sustainable solution to end extreme poverty in the DRC? Together we developed a sustainable social enterprise that we called a SEALI. A SEALI is the Swahili word for foundation, and we named it that because it really was a co-design effort with members of the community of the Eastern DRC. It's an enterprise that works at tackling access to health care, access to clean drinking water, and support to improve the livelihoods of smallholder farmers. So we're seeing not only increased health, health outcomes, but actually increased incomes as well, which will together ultimately eradicate extreme poverty. This is the first Asili Health Clinic. As you can see, it looks radically different than the previous photo that I showed. Here we have trained healthcare professionals. We have adequate access to drugs and to supplies. It's a clean facility really aimed at tackling the most common illnesses in the Eastern DRC. Here we're really focused on eradicating or eliminating under five mortality through these healthcare services. We have an agricultural center, the idea being that if we improve nutrition and livelihoods for farmers, that we will be able to see improved health outcomes as well. Here we've seen that farmers have had a five-fold increase in their incomes after the first three growing seasons because they now have access to both higher quality seeds but also access to local markets where they're able to sell their produce at a higher price. And we have five drinking water points that surround the clinic. Here we've distributed in the first six months about a million liters of water. And we've actually seen a decline in clinic visits because diarrheal diseases have actually decreased in the area. We believe that Asili will be big because we designed it with the people of the DRC. They're using a human-centered design approach and running co-design sessions with local women. We were actually able to design a solution with them where they were integral in designing the business model, the customer experience, and the branding, and truly feel ownership over it today. The community is buying in. We're seeing around the clinic that we have a local church and a restaurant and even electricity poles that have popped up. African music superstar Papa Wemba has written a rap song about Asili. And we've seen that Asili brand potatoes are a source of local pride and are selling en masse to hospitals, hotels, and local politicians. This is really just the beginning. Asili opened about six months ago. We've seen an initial thousand people at the clinic and about the same number who have participated in the agricultural programs. ARC has raised the funding to open an additional three centers for Asili in the Eastern DRC, and our plans are to reach about 50,000 people over the next three years. 
What your support will do is to enable IDEO.org to return to the DRC, to continue the approach of human-centered design, and to really figure out how to ensure that Astili is a sustainable business model, which is no longer required to, to run on donor support, but is actually able to support through the efforts of the community alone. This will allow us to scale the effort and bring Astili not only to the Eastern DRC, but throughout the Congo and throughout Africa. Thank you. Jocelyn, could you talk a little bit about political instability in the region and the challenges that that causes your efforts? Yeah, absolutely. So the idea was really that we were sort of tackling this issue um, with political instability in mind. Um, Southern Kiva, which is where we're working, has actually had much less political instability in the last five to seven years than North Kivu has. Um, so what we found actually is that these communities were really not investing in their local communities because of the previous political instability. And so what Asili has done is it's sort of been the first effort to help them refocus and rebuild those local communities. And so we're seeing that so far, so good um, in terms of South Kivu, but it's certainly something that we're staying abreast of and really working with local political leaders um, to really stay connected with them on this effort as well. Thanks, Thanks Jocelyn. Can you tell us how IDEO.org works with a few concrete examples in terms of, of promoting design thinking um, to improve the healthcare clinics, agriculture, and water um, uh, resources. Sure, so one example from the health clinics is that we met a number of women who said that they started getting prenatal care and they would go to one or two visits, but then when they would go the third time, the price might be totally different, more expensive than it had been the first or the second time. So we heard a number of women say that they just stopped seeking prenatal care because of the lack of transparency in terms of pricing. So this led us to the insight that if we were just to make sort of pricing um, and services more transparent and post them in the clinic, that we would really see a difference. And so we did that with um, really posting just um, sheets with the prices for the services, and that's actually encouraged women to continue to seek prenatal visits and then continue to bring their children to the clinic. So it's sort of these um, small insights that actually lead to these small shifts that then encourage people to continue to visit the health clinics. Um, I appreciate this idea of co-designing uh, the project with, um, uh, with the people that you're collaborating with uh, in the DRC. Can you give a concrete example of something that emanated from those conversations that surprised you and affected the design of the clinic or some of the other pieces of what you're doing? Sure. So we did this co-design work um, a little over a year ago. Um, and a couple weeks ago, one of our colleagues from ARC had actually returned um, to the area and was interviewing people, customers of the clinic and, and the water points and the agriculture programs. And he ran across a woman and she, she came up to him really enthusiastically and said, do you remember me? I participated in that co-design session and do you see the blue in the Asili logo? That was my choice. She said, I remember that we all sat there and I said that I thought it should be blue and someone else said that she thought it should be red and my neighbor said that she thought it should be yellow and they incorporated all of these colors because to that, together the, the community here needs to be brought together and this is what this effort and this is what Asili has demonstrated. So I think there's sort of these little moments of ownership that we're seeing that we never would have expected um, that are really encouraging to us. Can you um, talk about... Um, like what would happen to the program now if IDEO.org does not go back? Like how is sustainable is it right now? And you mentioned wanting to be able to make the program more sustainable with this return trip and what do you have in mind for that plan? Yeah, a big element that we haven't really worked out is in the membership model. And so the idea was um, if we could actually have people buy into membership um, for Asili, that we would really be able to integrate the services between health, water and agriculture even more seamlessly. We had some initial ideas from our first design project on what that membership model could look like, but there are so many elements of it that really need to be worked out because this is such a, a foreign concept um, in this culture. And it may be that the membership model isn't actually the right way to think about things, but I think one of the things we really want to focus on is, is what could a robust membership model look like that we would co-design again with the community. Um, and that would really allow for sustainability because it would allow for a more sustained source of income um, for the whole Asili business, um, which would then ultimately allow it to, to become self-sustainable after the first three years. 
Thank you. I'm hearing quite a sophisticated proposal here with different components. Um, for the $25,000 prize, do you plan to target it on a specific leg of that, or does everything kind of happen together? Yeah, so the funding has already been raised for the actual implementation or execution of the clinic, um, the, the additional clinics, the water points, and the agricultural program, the expansion of that. The 25000 is really focused on developing that sustainable business model through applying the human-centered design approach through IDEO.org's return work um, to the DRC and putting a design team together with Abraham um, and the local team in the DRC to really tackle some of these challenges, um, the sort of uh, more rough parts of this model that still need to be worked out to ultimately see its sustainability and, um, and real scalability. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jocelyn Wyatt, Asili. Thank you. And uh, our final presentation is the Onomatato Waco project that translates to See Your Baby and Copano Mobaso. mother's joy begins with new life stirring inside, a tiny heartbeat felt for the very first time, and a playful kick that reminds her that she is never alone. But for a young woman living in a remote or rural part of sub-Saharan Africa, falling pregnant is one of the most dangerous things that she can do. 800 women die every day from complications in childbirth and pregnancy. And 99% of these deaths occur in developing countries. What is most tragic about these deaths is that they occur from preventable and treatable conditions, conditions for which we have existing and effective solutions. When a mother dies during childbirth, her infant's chances of seeing their second birthday are grim, and her existing children face a life of considerable vulnerability. This is unacceptable, unconscionable, and should not be allowed to continue. My friend Crystal and I believe that we have the solution. Through our proposed mobile vehicle ultrasound scan clinics, we will take life-saving antenatal care two women living in remote and rural parts of low-income settings across the world. These women will be invited to Onam Totowako, come see your unborn child through ultrasonography free of charge. And whilst enjoying this precious opportunity to connect with their unborn baby, they will be offered screening for pregnancy-related high blood pressure, malaria, HIV, and anemia all of which contribute significantly to the unacceptably high levels of maternal deaths in these countries. And in addition to being screened for life-threatening conditions, they will have the opportunity to access health promotion messages in their local language through their mobile phones, not only in pregnancy, but up to the first year of their baby's life. This will allow us to remind the moms to come back for subsequent antenatal visits, to take their anti-malaria and HIV treatment at the right stages of their pregnancy, remind them to take their baby for vaccines when he or she is old enough, and to connect them to existing local services in their community. At the end of their visit, they will go home, not only with a picture of their unborn child, but an antenatal card with the correct dating of their pregnancy a life-saving set of numbers that will allow local healthcare workers to accurately diagnose and respond to preterm birth, the number one killer of babies in their first month of life. As African doctors ourselves, who both have, have the privilege of doing research in public health myself and obstetrics and gynecology, my friend Christelle, at the University of Oxford, we know firsthand just how important it is to have these initiatives rooted in the communities themselves. So our Onam Totowako clinics will be run by local healthcare workers and tailored to local needs. And in addition, we will be offering obstetric emergency management training and ultrasound scan training to local healthcare workers from across the region. 
to strengthen the healthcare system, but also to generate an income for the sustainability of this program. The $25,000 seed grant will be used to pilot this initiative in the Democratic Republic of Congo to prove that this initiative is not only scalable, but significantly and sustainably reduces maternal deaths. We've already made relationships with key stakeholders on the ground, and our plans have been met with great enthusiasm. I As have a to mother cut it myself. Off, I'm sorry. Four minutes. But we have to we can go to questions. Sure. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, have you thought through the risks of the unintended consequences of ultrasound screening and the impact on, say, sex selection or Absolutely. over screening? So absolutely. So this is something, I mean, we're taking a systems approach. We know that these kind of interventions can have lots of unintended negative consequences, but we also know this is something that needs to be done, that it's, a, it's not only the right thing to do, it's a human rights imperative. So instead of sort of shying back from that, we're just going to go into it carefully looking for that kind of thing. We know that there's been that kind of thing reported in India, but in the DRC, a child is wealth, and it's quite uncommon. We're piloting the DRC. We're going to be going in working with local healthcare workers, carefully collecting data to be aware of any possible unintended negative consequences. But that's not going to deter us from doing an intervention that is life-saving and can have dramatically significant effects. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, can you talk a little bit about, again, the similar question that I asked Jocelyn, political and cultural instability Absolutely. in DRC and how that's going to affect your effort here? Absolutely. So I thought the stage had ended. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So um, my partner, Crystal, is in fact Congolese, and um, her family has um, a maternal and child health clinic in the DRC, in Lubumbashi. Um, we're working in a region where we have good networks. We know the regional ministry of health. We know the head of the regional hospital. And we're working with the public health school in Kinshasa. So this is a community. We're, we're, we're setting ourselves up to win because we want to prove that this concept works. We know that there are lots of countries that are unstable. We want to do it in a place where we've got good networks, where we can make it work, where we've won trust with the community, and that we can show that the initiative is possible. But I agree with you that you obviously have to be careful in terms of what kind of challenges you encounter in different parts of the world. So uh, if the ultrasonographer detects something, let's say, like spina bifida uh, in a country that doesn't have really good access to, you know, fetal <coughs> surgery, what, what are the consequences of finding problems? Sure. So just to emphasize that all the interventions we're doing have been shown unequivocally to have massive impact. So we are combining existing proven interventions that make a huge difference to maternal health. The ultrasonography serves two purposes. It one, brings the woman to the clinic because everyone wants to see their unborn child. But two, and more importantly, it accurately diagnoses, it accurately can tell you the staging of the pregnancy. So women know when they do, so healthcare workers can know when a baby's born preterm. And then we are then using that opportunity to screen for all the conditions that I've told you for. If we do happen to find other conditions, we will refer women to the appropriate services. So part of our plan is that we are going to link up with existing services in the community, and we're, we're going to work alongside the health system. We're piloting the DRC, but the intention is to do this in many um, rural and remote settings. So for example, in South Africa, where there is a, a more robust health system, we would refer through the structures. In the DRC, we would work alongside the health system and follow the protocols that they follow. So we are taking existing interventions to women who can't access them, because in the health zone that we're going to, 80% of women do not access antenatal care because it's too far or unaffordable. Dr. Mabaso, just to follow up on that question, can you um, help us project outward in terms of what this looks like at scale and Absolutely. what the greatest challenge is to achieving scale? Sure. So I mean, in terms of the pilot, <laughs> In terms of the pilot, I mean, the initial plan is to set up a site visit, to work with the local community, to work with local healthcare workers so we can look out for any unintended negative consequences. And then um, to get the right equipment, to get the stuff that is suitable for, to, for use in this kind of setting, we've partnered up with um, Professor Andrew Shannon, who's been working in using, creating um, maternal health equipment that is suitable for interventions in remote areas. We've been in touch with the MAM Alliance in terms of mobile health for maternal health. 
um, and really looking to partner with organizations that are really doing this. Our pilot is going to be done over a period of four weeks. We have um, anticipate that we'll see 350 women in that period, and this is an area where there's almost no coverage of antenatal health care. We'll be giving 100% of coverage, and once we've proved this concept, our plan would be to scale up for 12 months because we're interested in what is the effect on maternal mortality, and you need to actually wait for a delivery, which takes nine months. So we will then do it in the whole health zone, and there are 17 health areas in that zone. So we'll be scaling it up around that to show that this works in the region and can be implemented in similar regions. How, how does this project get replicated in other countries and what are things you would be looking at as you're going into other countries? And also, is this something that you see um, only as a rural um, project or is it something that could be um, done in urban settings also? So to answer your second question, I think the, the remote and rural aspect is really important because um, this is, this is the area where so, so many countries have existing healthcare services and they are free, but many women in remote and rural areas can't access them, can't actually get to them. So we're really focused on the women who can't reach the services. Um, in terms of scaling them in other regions, we are going to be working alongside local healthcare systems to identify what works in those healthcare systems and taking that care to women who can't reach it. Um, so we're not going to just be parachuting into any country that we pick. We're going to be working with with systems that are there and NGOs that are there already. Yeah? How much do these ultrasound machines cost and is there a, a discount um, for them in Africa? Um, so we've identified, it's called the V-Scan, it's a portable ultrasound machine that can be charged with the battery of a car, so it's really nicely suitable for remote regions. Um, my friend Christelle is, works in obstetrics and gynecology, in fact works with a lady who trains doctors around the continent on this. So the cost of it is $4,000 and that's one of our biggest costs, but once we have the machine, this actually comes with a maintenance plan, so once we have the machine, that's kind of the big cost aside. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Kapana Mabasa. That concludes our five presentations. Now we're going to dismiss our judges to go deliberate. And now it's up to us to help them out in their decision by texting our uh, votes for who should receive the $25,000. And uh, so you can text the number, uh, which you see on the, on the screen there, 77948, and just uh, text uh, the, what you see there, Award 1, Award 2, Award 3. And to refresh everyone's memories, uh, we're going to uh, bring everyone back up on stage, uh, all of the presenters, right now. And we'll do a little, little QA, too. So if you have questions, uh, we'll have a, a moment to address them. Yeah, let's give him another round of applause. How about that? Okay. So just restating and to refresh everyone's memory, we have uh, Rubiat Khan with Doctor in a Tab. We have Abraham Verghese with Back to Bedside, Restoring Presence to American Medicine. Peter Drobak with Build Back Better After Ebola, the Equitas Fellowship and Entrepreneurial Leadership. Jocelyn Wyatt, Asili, Co-Designing the Future for, of the DRC. And Kapano Mobaso, Onomatoto Lako. Okay, um, so there are people coming around with microphones now, and we have just about 10 minutes while the judges are deliberating um, to uh, propose questions uh, to any, any or all of, of the presenters. So if someone wants to raise a hand and get the ball rolling, right up here. Thank you. I just wanted to understand a little better the business model. Who will pay for the $4,000 machine? The so question is about the business model uh, for Capano. So, so it's $4,000. Can you hear me? Is there a microphone? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, so the seed grant, if we are hopefully awarded, will we'll, we'll, we'll give us enough money to run the pilot. We're also training local healthcare workers, so doctors, midwives, in ultrasound scan technique and obstetric emergency management training for a fee, and that will be generating a constant income. We'll also be exploring how we can use the mobile health messaging for advertising as well. Thank you. And everyone should be voting now, not waiting until the end of the QA, unfortunately, because 
they'll need to see the results to the, the judges will need to know them so that they can make their decision. But we continue to ask questions as a matter of curiosity and provocation. So uh, who else has one for us? Thank you. Thank you all. They were amazing, amazing presentations. Jocelyn, this question's for you. You founded IDEO.org. You've been working on projects all over the world. Why is this the one that you put forward for this award? Why do you care about it this so much? Yeah, for us, um, this is a project that this is a project that we um, felt had a real promise um, when we first started working with a team at ARC. We've worked with them previously, um, and they've really implemented so many of the solutions. Um, I also felt like. This would be a great one to share because Abraham um, is here also as a New Voices Fellow. He's actually the country director for Asili in the DRC. And this seems like a nice collaborative project for us to pitch. So this is one that we, um, I think both of our organizations feel really, really committed to. One that we're committed to raising additional funding so that we can extend our work with ARC because we believe that there is so much promise um, and the team has just truly embraced human-centered design at the global level. Um, and across the country offices, and we really want to have a chance to, to go back and um, help to improve it even more. Thank you. There's one all the way back there. Fantastic presentations. Thank you. Peter, this is for, for you. Uh, hearing President Kagami speak on how uh, Rwanda turned around the situation. There was an amazing coalition of organizations from churches to businesses to everyone getting together to really make such a tremendous uh, change in the direction of that country. To what extent does your uh, success in other countries, you know, extend to those countries having similar um, policies to in include other organizations? Yeah, thanks. It's a great question. I think definitely one of the keys to Rwanda's success, and one of the things President Kagame always says when he's speaking to, to the people is, you know, none of us can sit around waiting for development to happen. We all got to stand up and, and get our hands dirty and get to work. Um, that goes for every person in the country, every organization, et cetera. Um, and, and I think that's an example of how the creation of those partnerships uh, and bringing everyone together really relies on great leadership. Um, and I think that's where we've got to start, and it's going to be a key, um, uh, a key element to the success of our program as well. Thanks. Um, hi, this is for Abraham. I know uh, um, diagnostic errors are a significant problem. We don't really have a good handle on how often it happens. Uh, so I'm very interested in your proposal. Um, can you talk about how you, uh, how, how you see uh, this kind of training to be able to actually turn, turn the doctor's attention away from the computer and to the patient? And are there some concrete steps that, um, that are part of your program? Well, you know, I think um, one, of the, one of the problems we've encountered is that the electronic medical record as it now exists uh, to me, is a form of fiction. You know, if you look at the medical record, according to it, everybody's had their reflexes tested, everybody's had every checkbox tested, and, you know, I have the opportunity to visit at the bedside with, uh, at other institutions and, you know, around with residents and students, and from time to time, I will throw in a litmus test. I will say, show me how you do the ankle reflex on this bedridden patient, and it's very often no one in the group has a reflex hammer, or maybe one in six has it. And yet, if you biopsy the chart, you know, it's, it paints a story that's completely different. So we need some truth in advertising. And I think one of the things that has to come about, about is people have to feel like there's a lot resting on their assessment of the patient. It's not just some token, ah, tick some boxes and walk away. And I think highlighting the kind of diagnostic errors that, that are going on is how we do that. Uh, it, was, it was amazing to me that uh, we had 240 anecdotes that we collected from physicians all over the country of oversights that led to consequences. And we had to send out thousands of uh, you know, questionnaires and we encouraged people to send it on to other people. And, and our, the journal editors at several places sort of had problems with that. They want a very clear you know, denominator, numerator, but you can't get at this problem except through narrative. And I think um, 
you know, the narratives show there's a significant problem. You can't go biopsy the chart to find out how big the problem is. It can only come through stories. So I think curating the stories has been a big step for us to try and make that change. Thank you. Anyone else here uh, right in the middle? Thank you. Brilliant present, uh, pitches, all of them. Uh, my question is to uh, Rubaiyat. Um, uh, you mentioned that the, the drug use will probably become more rational and uh, fewer prescri uh, prescriptions of antibiotics and things like that. And so is there a nexus between the pharmacist and the pharmaceutical companies as well? And do you foresee any challenges there? Absolutely. There are, of course, plenty of social challenges that we have to face in this work. Um, so one way we've addressed that is by making sure that they don't deviate from the prescriptions that the doctors uh, put forward. And uh, in some cases where we have found that deviation, we've actually uh, gotten them out of the system. And the reason that uh, they don't want to uh, risk that is because in every bazaar in that local community, uh, there are about five to ten pharmacists, each of whom are competing with each other. So there's pretty uh, intense competition. And we, keep, we select one pharmacist to actually host the system. So they become known as the mobile doctor. And so once they become known as that, they don't want to lose their um, privileged status. Uh, and therefore, they abide by some rules that we put forward. Uh, uh, so, so there are ways in which we address those, those kinds of situations. I enjoyed all your presentations very much, but my question is actually for the uh, rest of the Aspen Ideas Institute community. Um, and what struck me, struck me is that I had a hard time voting because you guys actually, there were several projects there that I thought, wow, these could make a real difference. And so my question to all of us is, what stops us from together choosing to fund, say, the top three of these ideas? Or all of them? That's not a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> Any, anyone else with any particular question? And then uh, I think we can cone out to the idea of social entrepreneurship and what we can glean from the expertise of these people who've made it to the top five finalists of all, all, all the pitches and have worked very hard to develop the, these, these ideas and um, can speak to the creative process, to entrepreneurship in general, and things that we can all glean from that. OK, one over there and one over there, as far apart as we can get. First, congratulations on outstanding presentations. Um, throughout the process leading up to this, you all got a tremendous number of votes on the Aspen Ideas Awards site. Can you all talk about a little bit about what you did to promote your ideas to the broader social entrepreneurial community? I could start. Uh, so in our case, we uh, promoted it on our Twitter, on our Facebook. Um, like we have about 3,000 people on our um, Facebook page, so they all contributed. And we also got our, um, so we got our uh, people involved. So in terms of uh, even our employees, uh, like everybody that we had on deck, like we basically got them involved, uh, telling people about our idea, the fact that we had reached to this stage and that we needed votes to get to the next stage, and, and that helped. Yeah, I think um, after writing the proposal, I think we put it on our Stand for 25 Twitter page, and uh, that's about the extent of it, uh, as, as far as I can recall. Yeah, I think one of the things I love about uh, you know Partners in Health is that it's a bit of a social movement, and there's uh, there's actually hundreds of thousands of people who who follow Partners in Health and who follow Paul uh, and are really passionate about this work. And so all we did was spread the word around the office and uh, and hope to went from there. Yeah, I would say ID.org. It was a similar approach. Um, we also had the benefit of having a partner with ARC, and so that together, uh, two organizations each had their own mailing lists and Twitter followers and um, staff that were willing to spread the word, so it was really helpful for us. I'd say the same. We used um, social media and also our existing communities, the communities we belong to in Oxford, um, and just did lots of presentations as well, um, wrote blog posts about it, shared with friends and family, so very, very similar approaches. So social media is always the answer. 
It's, uh, can I pose a broad question to, to everyone too that hopefully you can uh, address? Is you all taking on very big problems that could seem, seem insurmountable and, and kind of where do, you, where do you begin? But you've all made the decision to actively pursue this. And I'm wondering, you know, I know it doesn't always happen in some inspirational moment where you decide, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this, something I need to act on, it starts now. But is, was there a turning point for, for each of you where, where you can recall, okay, I can't just sit around and watch this happen anymore? I'll start. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it depends how much time you have. <laughs> no, I'll, well, I'll, I'll they're summarize. Obviously, they're, they're deliberating <laughs> for a long time, so obviously you've made the decision difficult uh, with all the great pitches. So um, I'll summarize. Yeah. I mean, so I'm South African. My friend, Cristal is Congolese. We've had privileged opportunities to do things that many people from our backgrounds are unable to do. So we've always felt a great responsibility to use our platforms to effect change. But particularly maternal health, I mean, it is something that's just shamefully high. In fact, there's a quote from um, a, a former head of the Society of Obstetrics and Gynecology who said that um, maternal deaths don't continue because society doesn't know how to stop them. They continue because society hasn't decided it's important enough. Um, and that really struck us, and we thought that this is important, and we also happened to be pregnant at the same time, so it was really just brought very personally and very close, um, and that it's something that we are just well-positioned to do. Um, so yeah, so it's just sort of, that's the short story of just something that we care deeply about, and that it's shameful that it continues and no one does anything about it, or not enough about it. I'll, I'll share a story. Um, so we were working with this NGO and uh, trying to create technology solutions for taking uh, healthcare to pregnant women. And uh, the project, uh, this was a philanthropic project, of course, and uh, a woman uh, that we went to the, to the field to visit um, had, complicated, had a complicated pregnancy. So she went through her pregnancy uh, with the project support and uh, like, what ended up happening was that the project actually ran out of funds just before she was about to deliver. So uh, the entire project wrapped up and there was no person to actually help her through her delivery and uh, in the postnatal period. And we don't often think of these stories because we, we consider a project in a time-bound way, uh, but there are like thousands and probably millions of people out there who actually suffer similarly as a result of the non-sustainability of philanthropy. So uh, for us, it was very much an imperative to think about how we can create a business model or think uh, about a way to sustainably deliver these services without having to rely on philanthropic funding uh, to keep it sustainable. Yeah, for me, there was a moment um, when I was in the DRC and we were visiting the existing health clinics like I showed, um, and there was a mentally ill man who was um, in the clinic just sort of moaning and um, the, the nurse who was running the clinic um, stepped outside with us and said to us, um, none of whom were trained medical professionals, um, what do I do? I don't have the training. I don't have the, the facilities. I don't have any knowledge of what to do in this situation with this mentally ill man. And I think to me that was sort of this... Um, this realization of kind of what was happening over and over and over again in a failed health system where we were just seeing that patients that desperately needed to be treated were just not getting adequate care at all. And so what he, the nurse had done was closed off the whole clinic, closed off the doors, closed the clinic to other patients, and essentially sort of locked this man um, in this clinic um, laying on a wooden bench, um, and that was sort of the solution. And so with that, that was sort of, for me, the realization that like it was just... Uh, uh, of course, we had to act. We had to do something. We had to work to address this terrible, broken healthcare system. You know, I think for me, I spent a, a good part of the last year, year and a half, working to try to assemble a team of great thinkers to to, to plan for and create this this new university. And the the notion of these kinds of creative collaborations that I'm proposing today were always a part of that. But what happened, you know, some months ago, as as we were in the midst of this, is that one of the guys that I was working with, who's a longtime friend and colleague who I had worked with in Rwanda, dropped everything, 
with his wife and moved to Sierra Leone um, to start a project from scratch. You know, Partners in Health had never worked in Sierra Leone before. We had no infrastructure. We had one small partner. He put everything on hold, put everything on the line and went there. And then somebody else did and somebody else did and somebody else did. Um, and that was, you know, inspiring and courageous for me. And I felt a little guilty that I wasn't one of those people able to go. And so honestly, the, you know, the way this came about is that we just felt a sense of urgency. We didn't want to wait three years before we could, you know, cut a ribbon at a new university and things like that. We wanted to do at least our small part to help as soon as possible. So I guess uh, my, my turning point was when I uh, went to meet a new group of residents to round on the wards. I was the attending physician starting that day and I couldn't find them on the wards and I eventually found them in a bunker where all the computers were, uh, the team room, and um, it was a very powerful metaphor for me. In fact, at that moment I coined the term the eye patient. The eye patient is the virtual construct of the patient who's getting fabulous care all across America. Mm -hmm. The real patient often wonders where the hell is everyone and that was sort of the genesis of my, my work the last few years. Okay. Well, th thank you all very much. Um, let's give one more round of applause for everyone. <laughs> the judges are back. We have a, a short 90-second uh, video from Booz Allen, uh, and we're going to watch that before um, the, the uh, reveal of the winner. Yes. Imagine. A world where healthcare isn't defined by wealth or poverty, but by compassion alone. Where education is a right, not a privilege. Where skies are clean and water is pure. Where borders are defined by nature, not politics. And where prosperity is the standard for all. Imagination leads to innovation. Where will your imagination take us? And now to announce the winner from the Aspen Institute is Britta Stevenson. Could I please be joined by all the, uh, all the finalists once again on stage? Drum roll, do we have some sort of like exciting drum roll music or something? <laughs> I also really wanted to have a big like six foot publisher's clearinghouse <laughs> check to give to the winner, but they wouldn't give one to me. Uh, so this is our very first pitch session for our very first Aspen Ideas Award. So it's wonderful that you all are here um, to be part of this, so thank you for coming. All of our finalists should be incredibly proud of the work they've put into not only their pitch, but obviously all the work that they do in their home communities that are very important to them. Thank you again to all of our judges. I hope this was fun for all of you. Marika Shiori Clark, Tara Montgomery, Tom DeRosa, our, our lovely Dean Dave Chokshi and Neil Bayer. Thank you again. And just to remind you, they, they've all used pre-selected criteria um, such as you know, feasibility, sustainability, and degree of need, as well as all of your votes to help inform whoever is in here, their decision. Um, one, last, one last quick thing, we are hosting a reception this evening in honor of all of, uh, all of our finalists, which will be at six o'clock in the Marble Garden tent. No, it'll be in the Ideas Pavilion, excuse me, which is the very big, lovely um, tent in our parking lot near the Pepke building. Any other housekeeping I need to? Nope, just go. <laughs> I do have, um... <laughs> sorry, I do have a lovely award to present as well. So with this lovely first award, we've got the winner is Copana Mobasso.
thank you so much. This is such a privilege. And I mean, all of these initiatives are incredible. Um, Jocelyn, I hope that we can work with you guys Absolutely. in the DRC. Um, thank you to the judges. Um, thank you to the Aspen New Voices, Andrew and the team, um, for your support and helping us get this far. Um, and yeah, I don't have much to say. Um, just thank you to my family for your support. Um, but thank you very much for this. And I look forward to um, giving you feedback in a year's time.